Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, know before you go, Scotland's Wild Highlands and Islands. Presented by NADHAP Expedition Leaders, Warwick Lister K and Simon McLaughlin. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you for being here with us today. Take it away, Warwick. Thank you, Rob. Thanks. Um, thanks very much for your introduction. And thanks to everyone who's joined us. I'm here with my colleague, Simon, as Rob mentioned. Um, this presentation, is, as Rob said, is entitled Know Before You Go. So it's going to be um, based on a number of questions that we tend to get from NatHab guests who are coming to Scotland. So I'm hoping that many of you listening have booked or are at least strongly considering booking and you'll find this presentation useful in terms of just being prepared, uh, knowing what to expect, and hopefully uh, with some packing as well. Um, I did do another presentation on the itinerary a couple of months ago, two or three months ago, uh, which is available on the NatHab website or YouTube channel. So that covers the itinerary in much more detail. And if you're interested in and listening to that and learning more about the itinerary, then I would refer you to that presentation. This one's going to be much more about the sort of nitty gritty of what to expect in, in some very specific areas on the trip. Um, as Rob mentioned, we really want to make the our talking bit as short as possible. And um, we would love for you to ask some questions. Uh, and we'll try and make more of this presentation a sort of Q&A um, than, than perhaps is typical. So by way of introduction, um, the topics we're going to um, cover are, first of all, I will introduce us in a little bit more detail. We're going to talk about the physical requirements of the trip. What can you expect in terms of walks and other physical activities? We're going to talk a little bit about um, couple of the uh, boat trips that we do, again, just in terms of you know, how difficult are they, how challenging are they, what to expect, um, and, and what sort of gear is provided. Uh, we are going to talk about our famous um, and not always entirely clement weather. Um, midges, what are midges and how do we mitigate that problem? Um, that's coming later. Uh, we'll give a bit of packing advice. Uh, we're going to talk about the very varied meals that you can expect on the trip in Scotland, uh, what you might do if you arrive a day or two early, and then, as I said, we're going to we're going to really turn it over to you and ask you to ask us questions, and hopefully we'll be able to to answer them. So let's get into it. So this. Um, gang here from left to right are Donald, Simon, who's here sitting here with me, uh, my wife Becky, and Nick. And Donald, Simon, and Nick are our expedition leaders in Scotland. So all of the trips this year will be led by either Donald, Simon, or Nick. And then supporting them in the kind of background are myself and Becky. We're a husband and wife team who write this itinerary, organize it, arrange it, and um, and then just try and support the guides as best we can. So you will you will um, you'll meet either Donald, Simon, or Nick. You'll you'll certainly meet Becky on every trip, and um, you will also meet me probably um, when you arrive in the Highlands. I try to meet all of the guests either off the plane or the train. And if I'm unable to do so because of a, um, I can't be in two places at once, then I'll come and meet you later in the hotel. So um, that's who we are. And uh, we're very much looking forward to getting the season started soon. Um, so Simon, I'm going to hand over to you. And we're going to talk a little bit about the walks that we do on the trip. Thank you, Warwick. Um, so I'm Simon, as uh, thank you for introducing me. Um, and uh, I, I'm just going to very briefly run through 
what you may expect when it comes to some of the activities, specifically the walks. So each day we like to get out and do a bit of a walk, whether it be a scheduled walk or there might be time in the evening when we arrive at our um, accommodation um, to go for walks. We, we really do encourage this part of it. We're not talking about hiking up big mountains like you see in the, in the image there. But um, yeah, some of the some of the routes will be um, a little bit up and downy, and in some places there'll be stones and um, and stepping stones through burns and rivers. Um, nothing too treacherous, but just uh, I suppose a few little pointers would be to think about what equipment you might want to bring with you. And certainly sturdy boots. As you can see from this picture, we've got uh, three people walking down slope. So there are some ups and downs on our walks. Um, and, you know, if you're liable to your ankle twisting a wee bit, you might want to think about wearing some footwear that will support your ankles. And, you know, most footwear has um, the famous Vibram soles. These, usually these are pretty good in these conditions. Um, it can be a little bit wet underfoot, um, which can mean it's a little bit slippery and um, we don't take it fast. So rest assured, we'll be stopping at regular occasions to either look at a landscape such as this on Sky, um, or we may be looking for or looking at some wildlife, whether it be far away or even under our own feet. So these are the sorts of, these images are quite good actually, they, they capture pretty much what you'll be expected to walk on. So as you can see, they're not level, they're not tarmacked. Um, so we do need to have our kind of eyes open and look where we're walking at all times. Um, as I say, we like to do this most days, if not every day. Um, it's important to us, and I think you'll agree when you get here, that getting out of the bus is critical to breathe the fresh Scottish Highland air and uh, enjoy sometimes some interesting weather. I, I, I choose interesting because sometimes it can be like this and within 5, 10, 15 minutes it can change. So uh, waterproofs are a must, I would say. Quite often I get asked every day when I'm out on the trip and I pretty much say the same thing. Take your waterproof jacket because if you don't, you'll need it. And quite often we don't need it, but it's best to have it with you. Um, I think that's well oh, the other thing I need to mention I guess uh, on the walks is um, it's not usually just myself or any of the other guides um, we usually have a, a second person on the walks with us so the main leader will be at the the front and somebody will be at the back but we try to keep everybody as close together as we possibly can because there's quite often things we want to share with each other um, and they're usually a there and back walk. So when we walk out, as you can see in this image here, we've got to as far as we're prepared to go because we're about to have lunch after this walk. And that's a vital part of the day as well. Um, so we walk out and then usually walk back again. So, yeah. I yeah, so the, I guess the point being that if at any point somebody feels that they don't want to continue the walk, that they can turn back towards either the lunch um, venue or the bus um yeah so so the, the walks can be made as short or as long as as guests feel appropriate great thanks simon so another physical activity that we do on the trips actually on the very last day is a canoe trip and we canoe down the river Bewley um for two or three miles over about two hours. Now, we often get guests who are expert canoers, and we always have guests who've never canoed before. And I really don't want anybody to feel concerned if they are not used to canoeing, they've never done it before, or indeed if they're not um, particularly strong swimmers. The canoeing is on a very, very mature and slow moving river. You can see the kind of state of the water here um, and um, they're very stable um, there's really nothing to be concerned about we also start the trip with a very comprehensive briefing from the um, activity providers you can see standing here giving a briefing to the group and he will allocate guests to boats according to their level of expertise and who they want to be with and, and other factors also 
if we have guests who are really not feeling happy or confident we can rope boats together and in fact you can just see that the last two boats there have been started to be tied together and that then effectively makes them like a really stable raft I mean, you couldn't tip them over if you tried um, and so you can just sort of float down the river paddling a bit as you go taking photographs enjoying the view as simon said breathing the fresh air and it's a lovely way for us to to, to spend the last day or part of the last day um, you do need to be able to sort of get in and out of the uh, canoe and we often find that after a couple of hours in the canoe people find standing up is quite difficult um, me included um, but again we will be there so the expedition leader two canoe operators and quite often myself as well will be there to assist getting guests out of the canoe and we really do that very slowly and deliberately and in a very safe manner um, so I don't think that the canoeing is really anything that anyone should be concerned about. It should be a highlight of the trip. Um, so, yeah, hopefully you'll be very happy. Big smile on your face, um, paddling down the river, enjoying yourself in the sunshine. That's what we aspire to. Simon's going to talk about the rigid inflatables. Dolphin mischief. I'm hoping you're seeing this image okay. We're moving on to um, motorized boats uh, or rigid inflatable um, boats and hopefully some of you have um, experienced uh, th this form of travel. Again, it's a bit like what I was saying with the minibus. Uh, this is a fantastic and a unique opportunity um, to get out to parts of the highlands that a lot of people don't manage to get to. We've actually engineered a couple, at least two, I think it is, um, boat trips on ribs, that is specifically. Uh, one of them is on Loch Ness, and this is a, a, actually, thank you, Warwick, uh, an image of uh, our trip last year on Loch Ness. Um, these ribs, as we call them, are uh, when they're moving, they can be a little bit up and downy, so but to mitigate for that, um, we do have um, some excellent guides and equipment. Um, so the, the seats are padded, um, and uh, usually we're not going we're not going full pelt. We're going pretty sedately, stopping to look at views or looking at wildlife, um, or to hear to, to to myself or listen to myself or the guide who is the um, boat operator who um, is well averse to the place we're visiting. So the Loch Ness one specifically is taking us um, off the road and giving us a very unique perspective on Loch Ness. And this is a chart, this is one we charter ourselves. So it really is a unique um, experience. Um, they're relatively easy to get on and off. Um, they're from us, you can see on here, there's a floating jetty you will have assistance from at least one if not two people to step you onto you'll see on the rib there uh, along the side there's these black strips which are a gripped material um, and you step down probably about a foot or a foot and a half yeah um, and again you'll be assisted and there's handrails on the boat as well you can see on the seats so you know getting in and out all you'll need to be able to do is take a reasonably you know like stepping up to steps on your stairs at home i guess um so there shouldn't be any concerns there hopefully um you're also provided with you'll see here these bright uh, yellow and blue all-in-one suits or they might be in two parts like a jacket and trousers these are well insulated um waterproof suits because it can be quite breezy even um when we're still on the water you know it can get a little bit chilly but in these suits uh i haven't had any complaints and it's good fun trying to get these things on and off you'll you'll certainly enjoy that part of it laughing if not at yourself at me or somebody else on their back trying to get their legs in i mean they they aren't as difficult as i'm making them sound they uh are usually oversized so you can usually get your boots through them quite easily as well you'll be thankful for these i'm pretty sure and they also come with the usual health and safety elements the the um flotation device the life vests thank you um and on at least one of those trips you you might see a couple of people there with some like ski goggles these really do make a, a massive difference if especially if there's a bit of spray or wind 
um, you can actually enjoy looking around uh, while we go along the loch there or out to sea. Um, sometimes we're offered dry bags, um, so if, if the, 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 the boat handler doesn't provide them, we may have some with us as well. So you can put things like a camera into a dry bag and keep it protected, hopefully. Um, I think, have I covered everything? I, there, say, I would say so, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So um, Scotland is famous for its extremely changeable weather. And this is just a fact of life um, that we, we live with. Those of us who are lucky enough to live here are used to, um, to dealing with that in our day-to-day -day lives. And that will be the case whether you come in May um, or through the summer or in, into the fall. You could have absolutely stunning um, cloudless skies, um, warm, no wind, beautiful days like this at the Callanish Standing Stones. Um, and then the next day, uh, it could be like this. This is um, one of the NatHab employees from the office in Denver, um, Tonya, um, <clears throat> on the Isle of Skye in the teeth of, a, of a, um, a gale and driving rain. And, you know, it's just a fact of life that here that sometimes the weather is like that. Um, we will do everything that we can to avoid you having to be out in these conditions. Um, you know, if there's a, if we're scheduled to do a walk and it's looking like that, we'll probably try and find something different to do that afternoon or that morning. But inevitably, um, we need to be prepared for getting caught out. And so full rain gear um, and a warm hat and gloves are really important, even if you're coming in in midsummer. And that's partly because of the risk of poor weather like this, but also as Simon just alluded to, when you're out on the rib um, on the North Sea, for example, even in the middle of summer and on a sunny day, it can be pretty chilly. So you want to be well prepared for, for that. So there's, um, that's actually a chart from the NatHab website. Um, just gives you an idea of our average temperatures. Our first trip is in um, May, early May. So you're looking at sort of highs of 58 and lows of 42. Um, and then it's roughly the same in the fall, kind of September, October, and it gets a bit warmer through the summer, June, July, July being July being our warmest month, at, you know, 51 to 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and as you can see there, we have a bit less um, rain in the spring. Um, and then it sort of pick, tends to pick up into late summer, July, August, August being one of our wettest months. And then it sort of drops off again a bit in, in September is usually a nice dry month. Um, and then October, 2.6 inches on average. Per, that's in a month, obviously, that's your average precipitation in the month. <clears throat> So, midges. I get the fun bit here. Um, <laughs> so, no seams you probably recognize. I, I, I've experienced those in, in North America, and yeah, I think it's a good comparison. Um, so, the Highland midge is a very specific midge. Uh, I can tell you more about these creatures when you come and visit in their biology and the fascinating fact about these uh, animals. But the thing we're focusing on here is. Uh, females that um, inflict little bites on us and it's not so much one of them that causes the problem as you can see in this image here uh, you get quite a lot uh, this is uh, I think this is a whole load of them sort of basically drowning on Warwick's hand <laughs> um, I think drowning is the right word because you probably put uh, some sort of uh, repellent yeah. on your hand or something and yes. um, so yeah we we try to engineer this trip and to be honest with you we have very little uh, major issues with um, the insects because we run the majority of the activities in the day. We've also been quite lucky with the weather, to be honest. Times when, so if you're not talking or grumbling about the weather, you're grumbling about midges. That's just the way it is in the Highlands. If it's windy, you won't even know there's midges out there. If it's heavy rain, you won't know there's midges out there. But if it's been raining, and then the wind drops and it stops raining um, that's kind of when they come out usually evenings and mornings but that's usually when we're having breakfast or having our evening meal so um, 
that's what I was talking about when I say we engineer the trip so that um, you know we try to avoid the midges. Um, we do provide uh, some equipment um, that you can fashion yourselves with the midge net, which is very effective. Um, it makes uh, drinking your water a little bit tricky sometimes, but uh, I'm sure you'll manage it. Um, and also we do provide uh, certain types of repellent and some of these repellents may have DEET in them. So just a word of caution there, you probably know this already, but the DEET can be quite corrosive to various um, plastics and rubbers, especially if you've got a, an, an expensive pair of binoculars or clothing that you really don't want to get damaged, I would suggest not using the DEET. Um, I do tend to use a smidge, which is a, a locally a highland made product, which doesn't have DEET in it. DEET in it. Um, I do use this, I work outdoors as does Warwick and um, I find it to be pretty effective. Um, and if it's really bad, I put this midgy net on, which you see in the picture. Um, I think that's probably about it on the yeah. midges, isn't it? I don't, you shouldn't worry about midges too much. Again, a bit like the weather, we, we tend to sort of try and work around them. And if, if it's a very, very midgy evening or morning, we'll just go and do a whiskey tasting or something else <laughs> instead. <laughs> um, so I just want to give you some general packing advice. Um, this is a group from last year with Simon there. I would say that they are a well prepared nat hub group for scotland you, you see that um, everybody's wearing multiple thin layers um several of the guests there have got the buff on the sort of neck I, i'm not sure if you call them buffs in in the states but um that neck protective um item of, of uh, garment um everybody's got a hat some of those ladies are wearing gloves um full length pants And then, as Simon mentioned earlier, you know, robust walking um, footwear. So whether you actually bring proper walking boots or just um, really good kind of trail sneakers, whatever suits you and you feel most comfortable in, but something that you're not going to mind walking on a bit of a rough path, path and occasionally through wet grass or, or even having to sort of hop over little streams or puddles. Um, so layers I've mentioned, um, full rain protection, very important, waterproof pants and a, you know, a really good Gore-Tex waterproof jacket is going to be vital um, and sturdy footwear. Um, lost luggage is less of an issue now. It was a, a real problem immediately after the COVID um, pandemic when the airlines were really struggling to get properly um, staffed and, and the airports were struggling and we had quite a lot of incidents of lost luggage. It, it's pretty, I would say it's back to kind of normal levels of um, now, but it's still worth just taking it, bearing it in mind when you're packing. And I would suggest putting into your carry-on bag, you know, a day's worth of underwear and maybe if you've got room, a change of clothes and some of your um, sort of vital Um, medications and um, toiletries. Just imagine having to kind of survive in Scotland for 24 to 48 hours without your main luggage and pack accordingly. Um, of course, we have shops here and we, we will, um, if people arrive and, and are really stuck for something in particular, we can um, whisk them off to a supermarket or a pharmacy and usually find what they're looking for. But it's a good idea just to, to have those things in your carry-on luggage. So I just want to talk quickly about the meals. We have a, a variety of um, eating experiences on this trip. Um, we start off in the Cool House Hotel. It's a really lovely hotel and their food, they take their food pretty seriously. It's this kind of fine dining experience. And we begin and end there. So it's a lovely place to start. You're going to really sort of pampered and treat yourself. Um, with some beautiful three-course dinners, um, as well as some lovely cooked breakfasts or continental breakfasts. Um, however, we also, on occasion, um, just have field meals. And um, the reason we do that is twofold. A, is that we want to maximize the amount of time out and about 
and enjoying the beautiful uh, landscape of Scotland and looking for wildlife. And many years ago, we used to take the group into a, a restaurant for every lunch. And actually, the f overwhelming feedback we got from guests was that they didn't want to sit in a restaurant for two hours in the middle of the afternoon meeting, eating a, a big meal. So we, we do various field meals now, packed lunches, um, maybe something like a pizza here. Um, we also, um, on at least one occasion, we try to eat when it's expedient to do so, uh, rather than, again, spending a lot of time sitting in a restaurant when we could be doing something more interesting. And the best example of that is when we take a two and a half hour crossing from Sky to the Outer Hebrides on this big 100 car ferry, um, we'll have dinner in the canteen on the ferry. And it, it, it you know, the, the ferry crossing coincides with dinner time. The canteen in the in the ferry is pretty good, and it saves us having had to do that somewhere else on a day when we've actually got quite a lot of interesting things to look at on Sky. So yeah, a variety of um, different eating experiences. If you arrive early, and I definitely recommend coming a, at least a day early purely from the point of view of, of um, acclimatizing uh, your sleep patterns and getting over jet lag. A lot of our guests do arrive, at, uh, they take a pre-night and um, they always turn up to the welcome meeting looking refreshed and kind of ready to go. Whereas if you've literally just flown across the Atlantic and then you go to the hotel, and then you've got the welcome meeting two hours later, um, not surprisingly, you're going to be a bit tired. So I do recommend the pre-night. And if you take a pre-night, I recommend taking it at the Cool House Hotel, which is the, the hotel that we use at the start of the trip. I recommend it because, look at it, it's beautiful. It's in this amazing rural, wooded location, fantastic grounds. Um, it's also um, a lot, I mean, cheap is the wrong word, but it's you get an awful lot more for your money at this hotel because it's half an hour out of Inverness than you do in the central Inverness hotels where they're really expensive. So um, I, I recommend taking the pre-night there. And what would you do for 24 hours? Well, you're going to enjoy the hotel and the grounds, but from the hotel, there's actually lovely woodland walks and riverside walks that you can do as well. And they will provide you with trail maps. And you can go off and fill a day just walking around, taking photographs, enjoying doing some bird watching, uh, simply soaking up the, the, the beautiful surrounds that you're in. Um, you can also do a day trip to Inverness. Now, as I said, Inverness is only half an hour away. So if you want to go and spend um, some time in the capital of the Highlands, um, then it's a relatively short taxi ride from the hotel. And there's a variety of things to do in Inverness, including um, walks along the banks of the River Ness and onto some lovely islands in the in the river, um, the Ness Islands. I was actually there with my kids two days ago, and we saw a number of um, dippers and um, goosanders as well. So did a bit of bird watching there. Um, and if you want, and if you want to contact me, we can arrange a private guide or, or give you recommendations of local private guides that can take you off to do other things as well. So you can easily fill a day and I think it's a good idea to come early. Again, in the event of lost luggage, it just gives another day for your luggage to find you before the trip starts. So that, is, that concludes our part of the presentation. Um, that's taken exactly half an hour. So that gives us a good bit of time to hand over to you and hopefully you've provided Rob with some questions, which we'll be delighted to answer. All right. Thank you, guys. Now, before we start with the question and answer session, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. And that's at the top right, those three lines. Click on those, and then you can find the questions in there. All right, so let's get to some of the questions. Uh, so can you talk about the walking? How far is our longest walk going to be? 
Yeah, that was a good question. So the trip is rated moderate by Matt Nathab, and I believe somewhere in the um, literature it sort of suggests that you should be able to walk two to three miles. In reality, that's probably longer than we'll ever walk. I would say if you can walk a mile on the kind of fairly um, undulating and sometimes uneven paths that were shown in the photographs, um, if you can do that with ease, um, including some incline and some decline, uh, moderate incline and moderate decline, um, then, then you're fit enough to do this trip. Um, so yeah, that, hopefully that answers the question. And we do those, you know, we'll be walking a mile, but doing it slowly, as Simon said, we'll be stopping to look at things and talk about things and hopefully see some wildlife along the way. And would you recommend using walking sticks or bringing those with us? Most don't. And if you don't use them at home, then you certainly probably, I mean, you wouldn't need them specifically for this trip. However, if you do use them at home, generally for, for kind of backcountry walking, then yes, I would recommend them. I mean, they're obviously great in terms of stability and just things like hopping over streams and getting over little boggy patches and things like that. Great. Yeah, we you. usually carry a pair a set with us, um, but only one set. Um, so if somebody did feel they needed them, we may be able to accommodate. Great, thank you. So let's talk about wildlife for a second. Can we, can you talk about what types of wildlife I can expect to see if I come on the trip? Yeah, sure. So um, we, as we mentioned, we take quite a lot of boat trips and we're definitely early in the trip. We're going to try and go and look for bottlenose dolphins um, in the North Sea. Um, they're a very special, um, uh, they're, they're a special population of bottlenose dolphins because they're much bigger than most bottlenose dolphins around the world. Twi almost twice as big as a, a bottlenose dolphin that you might encounter off the coast of Florida, for example. But we'll often, you know, of course, when we're going out to look for a particular species, we'll see other things as well. So we may see common dolphins, might see harbor seals, gray seals, um, a whole variety of, of seabirds. And if we're lucky, we might see larger cetaceans, um, such as minke whales, and possibly even things like basking sharks. Um, Later in the trip, we go out to the Shant Isles and we visit these extraordinary um, uh, colonies of nesting seabirds, including puffins and guillemots and razorbills, etc. Um, in huge numbers, of, I mean, half a million puffins. It's worth just mentioning, and again, I, I covered this in detail in the previous presentation, that that only applies up to when would you say simon that the birds leave this nesting cliffs yeah may june is the peak so june they're starting to tail off um july. oh july i suppose yeah you yeah. still yeah tailing off in july yeah. um yeah yeah so. so so the spring and summer trips are going to see lots of nesting seabirds <laughs> if you come in um september or october you'll see far fewer um, there's still a few birds sort of hanging around, but but there's other things that we'll look for. So, that, for example, again, the cetacean activity tends to be more um, visible in the later months. Um, in late September and October, we have the red deer rut beginning, which is just always a really dramatic and kind of um, iconic sight in the Highlands, seeing the red deer and hearing them roaring their challenges to each other in the glens. Um, we um, also the boat trips that we do out to the the Shant Isles, when, which is where the nesting seabirds are. When we do that boat trip later in the year, we'll often see large numbers of sea eagles, which is a, a relatively recently reintroduced cousin of the bald eagle, and um, always fantastic to see. Um, Simon's just scribbling a few things down in a notebook beside me. Yeah, so um, one of the, I mean, it's not wildlife, but one of the things that our guests often like to see is our Highland, our famous Highland cattle. Um, and they roam um, freely 
across some of the winding single track roads that we drive along in some of the remote places that we go to. And so we can come around the corner and find Highland cattle standing on the road, which is always a, a treat. And we'll stop and you know, get an opportunity to photograph them. Um, we have um, spe species of goats. We have a, a species of, of feral goat here that's been here since the Bronze Age and has been living wild in the Highlands for um, a couple of thousand years. And we'll, we'll often see them. And then, of course, a whole suite of woodland and moorland birds and mountain birds that we can uh, constantly be on the watch for. So it's a it's a wide variety of wildlife that we are either encountering just as we're making our way through the highlands or that we're specifically going out to look for. Um, have I missed anything obvious? No, I'm just writing things to remind myself to, yeah. you know, otters. Sort of mention. Yeah, we're always yeah. on the lookout for otters, especially along the coast of the of Sky and the and the Hebrides. I mean, it's probably worth mentioning things like bog. We'll be exploring miniature wildlife because uh, wildlife is challenging to show people in the Highlands because um, it is so widely distributed away from roadsides quite often. That's why we take the boat trips. But um, some of the things that I particularly am quite passionate about is the, the micro world of carnivorous plants and invertebrates that, you know, sort of roam beneath our feet. And I'll open your eyes to that world, which doesn't take much walking, to be honest. And the, the Western Atlantic oak woodlands, which are, you know, world renowned habitat that uh, we almost lost uh, due to high numbers of deer populations in the highlands and these are quite unique to the west coast of the British Isles and we will see some of these uh, oak woodlands as we drive along and some of the walks we do in the, the Caledonian pine woods of course as well we'll see as as we explore the highlands yeah mm. we had we we have introduced a new part to the itinerary this year which is um, to take a train um, through, past a very, very famous and beautiful glen called Glen Finnan. There's a viaduct um, that the train, this sort of curved viaduct that the train runs over. Any of you, any Harry Potter fans amongst you will recognize it. Um, and we go to a place called Maleg, which is in a very, very remote um, little fishing village right off the west coast of, of Scotland. And from there, we take a boat trip to a peninsula called the Noidart Peninsula, which is really one of the most wild parts of the United Kingdom. Very, very few people ever go there. And in fact, despite the fact that I've lived in the Highlands my entire life, I only went there for the first time when we wreckied this trip with Simon and, and Nick. And in fact, that photograph you saw at the beginning was during that recce. And as we were returning back into Mali Harbour um, on that recce, we were um, we encountered two grey seals who were obviously hanging around in the harbour waiting for fishermen coming in to sort of probably toss them a bit of bycatch or a, a, a mackerel. And they came right up underneath the boat and they were looking at us and sort of blowing bubbles at us. And grey seals are, you know, we, we have a globally significant proportion of the world's um, grey seal, gray seals. And they're pretty big animals, uh, much bigger than your harbour seals, which we also have. Um, and um, it was a real treat to see them, especially so close and such in such an engaging way. They were looking right at us and, you know, basically trying to beg food from us, which was quite, quite cool. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. Let me ask you this. What about reindeer? Would, would we see reindeer? Well, it's an interesting question because there is actually a herd of reindeer in the Highlands of Scotland. Um, they're a managed herd um, and they are um, kept within the Cairngorm National Park, but we don't go there. Um, it's not part of this trip. Um, and so um, we won't see reindeer. Um, we do see, as I mentioned, the feral goats, um, which are, you know, sort of fill a similar kind of ecological niche, but no, no reindeer, I'm afraid. Is there any fishing on the River Ness? Yes, there's salmon fishing. Um, and I imagine there's trout and pike fishing too. I, I need to look into that. Um, the salmon fishing is very um, sort of sought after and it's extremely expensive. 
Um, and I, I, I have never done it myself, but I would be pretty certain that it would be something that would need to be arranged well in advance. Um, but yeah, if that was something that was of interest to people, I could certainly look into it. Great, thank you. So if I didn't want to go canoeing, is there another option, maybe walking around town to take photos, anything like that? Yeah, so occasionally we get people who are just like, no, I hate water, I'm not going in the canoe, and, and that, that's fine. Typically what we will do then is ask um, the, the coach driver to take them off on a little scenic drive. And the place that we go canoeing from is very close to a very beautiful sort of somewhat hidden valley, um, which not very many people know about. And so I generally ask the bus driver and occasionally if I'm about, I will go to um, to take them for a little drive up, up this beautiful um, glen for the purposes of, you'll quite often see deer up there, you might see golden eagles, um, but anyway, it's just a beautiful place to be. And um, they'll, they'll go, yeah, go up there for an hour, have their packed lunch, and then come back down again and, and then reunite with the, the group for the rest of the day. So is uh, the ferry crossing relatively calm since we'll be eating dinner on the ship? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. It's, and it, you know, it, you won't be surprised to hear me say it's quite varied. Sometimes it can be a flat calm. That's pretty exceptional. Often it is not, it's quite bumpy. And I've been on it once or twice where it's been quite exciting. Um, I have to say that those big ferries are amazing. They're stabilized. And I find it extraordinary the way that they handle the waves. Um, I'd be I'd be a liar if I said that there aren't occasions where people don't feel that hungry on the on that trip. Um, so that can happen, but on the whole, the, there it's a big ferry. As I said, it's a hundred car ferry. It's got you know several lounges, um, two restaurants, a bar um etc um and and they're stabilized so um even when it's a bit lumpy the this crossing's generally not too bad so if i have specific dietary needs whether i'm gluten-free or vegetarian is this trip going to be a feasible option for me uh yeah 100 percent. we every single group that we have has guests with a, a variety of different dietary requirements um, and um, and we will cater for them without without difficulty yeah Great. i'm usually yeah. one of them to be honest i i'm a dairy free um so and we, we've, we've had some really quite challenging ones where we've catered for them quite well i feel like celiac we had one yeah. guest who yeah um, most years we have a couple of celiacs yeah 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 so are the lodgings different every night? Or are we staying in one specific place? Um, it's we use three different hotels and we stay um, in all of them for at least two nights. Um, and as I mentioned, the trip begins and ends at the Cool House Hotel. So we stay there for two nights at the beginning and then we, we sort of come back. And it's it's I mean, all the hotels are um, excellent in their own different ways but the cool house hotel is i would say the cream of the crop and so it's quite nice that we start there and then we and then we end there it's almost like coming home to this wonderful family run you know very um, lovely hotel are there any horse farms to see on the trip um you will, they will certainly see horses in fields as we drive through the highlands, um, especially over here in the east. There's quite a sort of high level of equestrianism and horse ownership, and um, there's livery stables and and fields with horses in them. And then as we head west, you get more of the sort of garran ponies, which are the ponies that are used or have been used historically for bringing deer carcasses off the hill um, in the shooting season. Um, and they are a, a quite an iconic thing to see in the Highlands, these amazing sturdy um, white ponies. And, and yeah, there are places where we can 
see them. And in actual fact, the Cool House Hotel has a field. Time has just reminded me that the at the bottom, so that aerial photograph that I showed you of the Cool House Hotel with that lovely lawn in front of it, at the bottom of that lawn, there is a field with horses in it. Um, so for, for anyone interested in horses, they'll be able to go and probably feed them a carrot over the fence. So what is the best time of year to come out on the trip? And if I wanted to see gray seals, is that a different time? Okay, so no, gray seals you could see at any time of year. Um, it's very hard to say what is the best kind. I, I, time, I don't, I could be, and I don't want to give particular sort of preferential weight to one season uh, than another. I, uh, and obviously I would say this, wouldn't I? But I love it, it all. If you really want to see puffins and in huge numbers and that sort of phenomenon of the nesting seabirds, then you, you really need to come in May or June. Um, because it, although we do take the boat trip out to those islands later in the year, as I, as I mentioned, the bird numbers will be very significantly reduced. However, in my opinion, things like um, the beautiful fall landscape, uh, landscapes that we get, the red deer rut, the fact that the the incredibly long days that we have in the summer are shortening in October. And um, so we get kind of more dramatic sunsets and sunrises and um, as well as a whole lot of subtle things like um, geese arriving from the north and other migratory birds leaving and, you know, an eruption of fungi make the fall trips really beautiful too i mean i i personally love the fall i think it's a really beautiful time to be in the highlands um i also love the spring i mean the summer's great too so, that's, uh, so i don't know simon what do you think yeah no thanks for asking because i was just thinking about that question it's a really good question and everybody has their favorite times of year wherever they go or live um to be honest we can get all four seasons in one day and nature does tend to sort of react to that. Um, quite often I find when guests are um, in the highlands with me, um, they're interested in the bird life in the woodlands as well. And there's some quite unique birds that to us are quite common. Um, and it really kind of makes me realize quite often how incredible they are, even though I see them quite regularly, things like ch chaffinch and dippers. Um, and they being um, resident birds, there's no good or bad time to see those. So there's there's always nature to see. And quite often when it's raining, they're a bit more bold and courageous because I think they probably think we're inside having a dram. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that there's a lot of wildlife that can be found um, all through the year, I would say. And as Warwick says, in the autumn, you get the, the rutting deer, hopefully, as well, which can be a little elusive in the summer because in the summer they're going up onto the higher ground to, you know, graze on the higher pastures. Will we get to see any castles during the trip? <laughs> yes. Um, castles are ten a penny in the highlands of Scotland. Um, so you'll see a number. Um, most famously is Elan Donnan Castle. It's one of the most fo uh, photographed and recognizable castles in the world. And we just happened to drive past it three times. And of course, we'll, we'll stop and we'll, we'll get some pictures of it. Um, there's various other, just like in, in the photograph we showed you earlier of the rib trip. Um, it begins right next to Urquhart Castle, which is a ruined castle on the shores of Loch Ness. Um, and it's very heavily touristed, but we obviously NatHub um, does it differently as, as we like to do with NatHub. Um, and so we, we take the rib and we get a very unique pers perspective of it from the water, um, which is lovely. So yeah, you'll see, an, we'll see a number of castles. So will there be opportunities to sample some scotch, 
and whiskey. <laughs> Excellent question. <laughs> of course, I'm going to let Simon answer that one because he's more of a Scott, uh, a whiskey fish, um, aficionado. I mean, I used to drink more in my younger days, but now I tend to have maybe the odd dram, and I could always be persuaded of an evening to share a dram with somebody. And if they want to experience one or another, they may do a bit of homework and think, well, I want to try one of the Western Isle whiskies, or maybe I want to try a Speyside malt. Um, yes, it's a big fat yes, really. Um, we all do enjoy a dram. So I may even surprise you on one element of the trip with a dram. You never know. <laughs> and all, all of the hotel bars will be well stocked with a wide variety of malts and blended whiskey as well. So if we do arrive early, will there be, uh, uh, will we be able to get back from the air, airport to Coal House? Yes, if you're coming to the Coal House Hotel and you arrive within 24 hours of the start of the trip, I will come and meet you and take you to the hotel. If you book elsewhere, um, ooh, I actually need to check the specific details on this. I don't have the information right at my fingertips, but I think you're, it's your responsibility to get to the to the to the elsewhere, and then the following day I will come to the to the, that hotel or bed and breakfast or whatever it is, and and bring you from there to the Cool House Hotel. I think that's the arrangement, but um, I may stand to be corrected on that. And if I'm leaving on an early morning flight, will I have any issue getting there on time? No, and in actual fact, the way that the flights, the way that the kind of cookie has crumbled with the the flight that the majority of our guests take, which is from Inverness to down to London, uh, to Heathrow to then get the transatlantic flight, um, it mildly unfortunately that flight tends to leave at seven a.m. and so that does involve leaving the hotel at around about four thirty a.m. But we and we find that probably 80% of the guests do that. And so, and of course we, we make that arrangement and we'll provide a boxed breakfast and, you know, the, the expedition leader will be up and making sure that you're, uh, you've, you, you haven't slept through your alarm clock and all the rest of it, helping you with your bags, etc. So yeah, that's all taken care of and arranged. That's a bit of a red eye flight, but it's just, just happens to be the, the most convenient one for getting back across the Atlantic. And now, if I really wanted to get a detailed look at the itinerary, uh, you mentioned there would be a place that we could see that. Can you tell us where that would be again? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, the NatHack website is a is the best place to start on the on the web page. Um, there is a, an overview of the itinerary and I think a, a downloadable PDF with a detailed um, description of the itinerary and then there is a daily dose of nature presentation that i gave um a couple of months ago which goes over the itinerary in much more detail i don't know rob maybe you you, you might have, have a better idea than me of where that can be looked up would it would it be on the nat hub youtube channel yeah, we have a link to it on our web page at nathab.com slash webinars. Uh, so head over to nathab.com and you can find all of this information right there. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Well, unfortunately, that is going to be the last question that we do have time for today. So I would like to throw it back to you for any closing comments you guys may have. Great. Well, look, thank you. And thank you for all of the questions. We're delighted to have that engagement. Uh, we're at the end of a long winter here in the Highlands and we're raring to go. We're very much looking forward to the arrival of our first guests um, in just a few short weeks' time. Uh, we're really looking forward to seeing you and um, thanks, for, thanks for listening. Thank you. Looking forward to the adventure, sharing the adventure with you. Gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. Now, if you are interested in information on how you can travel with NatHab, please give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. 
you can check out this week's lineup, including registration links on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude today's webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.